words of a person are not enough. There is no life in the words of a person. Let's give kind leave and reward on his mentions. Aber Herr, du bist selbst das Leben. Dein Wort ist Leben. Lord, you are life and your word is life. So we ask you, Father, speak words of life to us. We bid me, Vater, lass dein Wort des Lebens heute zu unser Herz kommen. Speak to our hearts, not just our minds. Rede zu unser Herz, nicht nur unser Verstand. Wir danken dir, Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Ich möchte Johannes 15 aufschlagen. I want to look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I have to remember I'm preaching in English first. Deutsch kommt danach. John chapter 15. The Gospel of John. Starting with John, we're not reading it, but starting with John chapter 12, Jesus is on the way to the cross. John chapter 13, he washes the disciples' feet. He says someone's going to betray him. And Judas leaves to betray Jesus. And then Jesus begins to talk to his disciples, just them, just the eleven, just the faithful, just those that stayed with him to the end. And he tells them, John chapter 14, about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that he's going to send, the Helper that he's going to send, that he's preparing a place for them, that he's going away. It's an intimate, heart-to-heart -heart conversation with his inner circle of disciples before he dies. And in the middle of this, he talks about who he is and who we are. It's John chapter 15. And this puts another importance to this when we realize this is the context. Jesus is on the way to the cross. He's talking to us, of course, because we're his children. But he is talking to his most trusted inner circle. And that's who we are if we belong to him and we're born again. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that, your joy, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Then verse 16, verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. We know this passage is a familiar passage. But there's
there's so much there. He says, verse 1, I am the true vine. Not, I'm the vine, I am the true vine. That means, it means true inside and out. Substantially true, essentially true, connecting visible facts to its underneath, underlying reality. It is, this vine is the only true vine. I thought it was interesting. He says, I'm the true vine. Why did he say that? Why did he say I'm the true vine? Why didn't he just say I'm the vine? Because there are false sources. A vine is connected to the branches and there are false sources for branches. And he's saying to his disciples before he goes back, to heaven, he said, I'm the true vine. I'm your source. I'm your only source. I'm the real vine. Don't be deceived by other vines that offer other things. And he says, we know this, but let's look at it. He says, my father is the husbandman. The Bible is full of examples that Jesus used for the everyday life of the people. And some of us, we've been in the, in the vine bag here. You've seen all the... the grapevines. But these fields belong to a husbandman. They belong to an owner who has planted those vines. Those vines are not their own. They are planted for a purpose. They are watched over by the gardener, by the husbandman. It is his job to take care of the vines. And he says, my father is the husband. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's interesting. He says it right at the beginning. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he says, he cuts it off. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it will bring forth more fruit. You see, a wine gardener, I can't think of the English word, a husbandman does not plant vines to decorate the hills. They are beautiful. But that's not why they are planted. They are planted to bring fruit, fruit to eat. And the Father has planted Jesus as the vine to bring fruit. And we read it's for his glory. He gets glory by us bringing fruit. I don't want to disappoint you and I, but the reason you and I are here is to glorify Jesus, to bring him fruit, not to have a happy, fulfilled life. You will have that if you follow him. But it's not about you and I. It's about the husband. It's about the true vine. He says, you are here as a branch connected to the vine to bring fruit that will glorify God. Fruit of character, fruit of the spirit, fruit of souls coming to Christ. And there's probably more to it than that. But he's so serious about it. He says, if there's a branch that's not bearing fruit, he cuts it off. Now that's what a wine guard, what a husbandman does. We, we all know how they take care of the vines. If there's a branch that's growing and it's not bringing fruit, he will cut it off. Why will he cut it off? First, it's useless. It's wasting the strength and the life of the vine because it's not bringing forth fruit. It's a waste. It's useless. It's not created, it's not doing the purpose for which it is in the vine. And he says he will cut it off. But, this is, the, this is the painful part. He says, if you're a branch and you're bringing forth fruit, he's going to cut you back. He's going to purge you. That you bring more fruit. You see, people that know about plants, which I don't, but people have told me, if you have a plant, and it's growing, and there's a part of the plant, there's a branch, there's a part of the plant that is growing and is not bringing forth fruit or it's starting to die, you cut it off because the plant is putting energy into that part of the plant that's not growing, it's dying, and it's that the plant itself is trying to bring energy in and so you cut it off so the energy can go into the other part of the plant. And that's what the wine gardener does. He cuts off that part that is not bringing fruit. And he says, if it's bringing fruit, he purges it. Now, this word is interesting. This word means he purifies it. We know that when the uh, wine, I'm sorry, it's hard to speak English. When the, when the vine is growing, the, the wine, the grapevine, he cuts it back. 
at the end of the season, they cut them back where there's almost nothing left. Because the husbandman knows when it's cut back, it will come back fuller. It will come back and bring forth more fruit. And God says to you and I as branches, because if you are a born-again believer, you are a branch, you are connected to the vine. If you are not born again, you are not connected to the true vine. You're connected to something else maybe, but not him. And he says if you're bringing forth fruit, he'll cut back the things that hinder that. He'll cut off the things, that part that's dead, that part that stinks like the world, that part that reflects the world, that attitude, that situation, that relationship. He says he'll cut it back, not because he's mean, but because he wants us to have fruit, because he wants his life to flow through us, that he be glorified. It's about him flowing through us. And this word, where he cleans it, where he purges it, it's to be made pure of that which is undesirable, that which is contaminated. If there's a part of the vine, the grapevine, that's getting sick, they'll cut it off so that the sickness will not do. If you have bitterness in your heart, God's going to deal with that and cut it off because he says the whole, whole group of vines can be infected. If there's something there that is not right, that is self, sin, loving the world, he says, I will cut it off that you may bring forth more fruit. And it is painful when he cuts back something. It's painful when he says, that relationship has to go. I've had it in the past. Where I saw that is not right. It is not glorifying God. It is pulling me down. It is bringing me into temptation. I had to cut off some relationships in my earlier years. It's not only just relationships, whatever God says. When, when God says that has to go, it's for our good. It's for our growth. It's for our being more connected to the vine that he gets glory out of our lives. And, and only the husband man knows what's not good on the grapevine. We don't always know. But he doesn't. He loves us. And he has a purpose. This is very interesting. This word, um, he cleanses it. It means without mixture. When there is a mixture of flesh and spirit, he says, I'm cutting it off. I'm cutting off that mixture. God wants purity. And he'll cut off that which is spiritually unclean and the mixture. Because when there's a mixture, his life cannot flow like it needs to. And his life... You know, the, probably the greatest fruit is that people see Jesus. You see a vine. We've had this before, but a tree brings forth the fruit that it is. An apple tree brings forth apples. A grapevine will bring grapes. Jesus, as the vine, will bring Jesus. Jesus is the fruit. His character, his life, himself revealed to the world. And anything that hinders Jesus in our lives... God says, I'm going to cut it back, not because I'm mean, not because I'm mad, not because I'm punishing you, because I love you, because I want you to be bringing forth fruit for my glory. So the grapevine is planted to bring forth grapes. He says, verse 3, now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. It's the same word. You see, fruit comes through holiness. Because God is holy. I'm not talking about a weird kind of holiness where you have these outward rules. But the holiness that the Holy Spirit brings, that the Holy Jesus brings, this loving Him, separated from the things that hurt His heart, that grieve Him, that hinder his working in our lives. This is holiness. Set apart for God. You see, those vines that were planted, they were for the husbandman. They weren't for just anybody. They were for the husbandman to bring forth fruit. And you and I are for God. We're for Christ. We're set apart. That's what holiness is. Set apart for him, to him, for his purposes, to be his vessel, to bring forth fruit. And that fruit is life, the life of Christ. And he says, you are made holy through the word. We've talked about the word of God. There's such.
such a power in the Word of God. The Word of God cleanses. You're washed through the water of the Word. Every time we hear God's Word, every time we read God's Word, think about it, meditate on it. There's a cleansing that takes place. His Word is part of that pruning. We read something and we go, Oh, Lord, I'm not, that's not what's happening in my life. Lord, help me, change me, forgive me, teach me, whatever it is. The Word of God cleanses us. He says, You're cleansed. Our holiness is Jesus. That's the beautiful thing. People try and be holy in their own thing, doing their own rules. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, He is our sanctification. He is our holiness. He is our righteousness. What a relief. So, as we are connected to Him, and that's the key here, abide in me, be connected to me. I have a, where is it? Somewhere. Where's my head? Thank you. This is not a, <laughs> this is not from a grapevine, obviously. It's from our garden. It was cut off Thursday, and I put it in water so it wouldn't be too dried up. But this branch, this is what Jesus is saying. We know that. But here, he says, you're the branch. You are not the vine. Pretend this is a grapevine. He says, you've got to be connected to the vine. This branch is cut off. It's been cut off from a tree in, in our whole backyard. This branch looks alive, but it's not. We all know in a few days this will be wilted. And this, this branch will never bring flowers. Never. It will never bring fruit. It will never bring flowers because it's cut off, in this case, from the tree, from its source. And Jesus said, you will never bring fruit because you are totally dependent on me, my life. This right here, it's cut off. It's cut off from life. The life of the grapevine, the life of a tree, flows through the branches. And Jesus says, for my life to flow through you, you must be connected to me. And you must stay connected to me intimately, in your most innermost being. And we are, unless we say I'm walking away. But he says, abide in me, verse 4, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except, you abide, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. And abiding in him, abide means to continue with him, to dwell in him, to remain in him. And it's a primary verb. It's, it's to abide, continue, and one, one commentator says, something has established itself permanently within my soul and always exerts its power in me. Something that bleibend in unser Leben, diese Verbindung mit Jesus, und dieses Sein Kraft, Sein Leben fließt in uns hinein aus ein Rebe. Und wie viele Christen, oh, I'm speaking German, sorry. <laughs> um, so, I don't know where I was, but um, thank you. So, so many people are trying to produce out of their own self, but a branch can bring nothing. It has to be connected, there has to be life. We know that, but do we really know that? How many times do we, do I, do we try to bring forth spiritual fruit out of our own self, our own efforts, our own understanding, our own abilities, our own talents. There is no life in a branch by itself. And even when we're connected, which we are, there is no life in us. I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to say to you or anyone else except what Jesus gives through his word through his life. He's life itself. He's fruit. He is all. And to realize we can be a lot less stressed if we realize his life flows through me. He's flowing through me. Fruit will come as I live with Jesus. We want to see fruit right away. I do too. But fruit takes time. As we continue to be remain in him, stay in him, fruit will come. Not because you and I are anything, but because he's life. 
because we're connected to him and his life flows through you and I. His life and his life will bring fruit. An apple tree will bring apples. A grapevine will bring grapes if it stays connected. And Jesus is also the root. We read in Revelation that he's the root, the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. We read in Romans 18, 11, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root beareth thee. You see, a grapevine, or any kind of tree, but we're with the grapevines, they have roots, and those roots go down deep. And that's why the grapevine brings life into the branches because there are roots, and Jesus is the root. And the, the branches do not carry the root. The root carries the branches. Our life is rooted in Jesus. Our life is rooted in God. And it says in Romans 11, if the root be holy, so are the branches. Jesus, the root that came up out of dry ground from the offspring of David, he is our holiness. His righteousness, his purity, his holiness flows in to us as his branches, but it comes from him. He's the root of it all. So if we're cut off from him, we don't have any holiness of our own. Basically what that means, total dependence upon Jesus. This branch was totally dependent on being connected to the tree. It's cut off. It's going to die. It has no life in itself. And so it is with us. We are totally dependent upon Christ. We read in Colossians 3, 4, Christ who is our life. We read in Colossians 3, 11, Christ is all in all. He's everything. And it takes away so much stress when we realize that. We have to do part two next week. He says, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. When we abide, we bring much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. We say that so easily. But there's a part in every person called self, flesh, that says, yeah, but I have... I can bring this to the table. I can serve God with this. I have this talent. I have this ability. I have this education. Yeah, we have it all. But without connected through him, being connected to him, it will bring no fruit. There is something. This, this sentence from Jesus, without me you can do nothing, cuts at the root of self and the flesh. Cuts at the root because who wants to say, oh, I can do nothing? Not self. But we're that branch. And when we realize, I can do nothing without him. But with him, all things are possible. That's the other side of it. Hallelujah. Connected to him, all things are possible. What you cannot do, he can do. What I cannot do to reach people for Christ, he can do. What we cannot change in our life, he can change. Because he brings life. He brings fruit. Jesus Christ himself. It's not a concept. It's not a philosophy. It's a person. And he says, if you abide in me, you will bring forth fruit. But you need to know you can do nothing of your own. You're totally dependent on me. Have you ever heard of a branch of a wine, of a grapevine saying, no, I don't need the grapevine. I can do it myself. <laughs> Try it. Verse 6, if a man abide in me, he is cast, or if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If a person does not stay connected to Jesus, he's going to die. Just like a branch. This is going to dry up. It's going to go in the trash can. Probably won't be burned, but back then they burned them. That's what Jesus said. That's how important it is for him that we bring fruit, that we are connected with him this relationship, this unbroken fellowship. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. Oh yeah, that sounds better now. <laughs> if we're connected to him, he says, your prayers will be answered. 
but they will be answered because we're so connected with him, we're so full of Jesus that we will ask the things that are his will. We won't be asking our will, we'll say your will, because that's the life of Christ, not your, my will, but your will. And he will answer our prayers. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. I think one of my greatest fears is at the end of my life to stand there and just have had a little bit of fruit. He says, here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. We don't always see the fruit. We can't always see it. And what we're doing at Alexander Todd's, we don't see the fruit all the time. But I am 100% sure there are going to be people in heaven because you and I went to Alexander Todd's because God is bringing in his harvest and he's seeking people and he loves people. And he came to seek and to save the lost. He said, My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Abiding in Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. And fruit will come. The branch does not have to strain and stress to bring fruit. Oh, I'm going to bring grapes. Ah! It flows naturally through the relationship. It's, it's liberating. It's free. How do we abide? Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in me. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's what Jesus said. We would say something else. <laughs> Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Abiding has to do with relationship. We obey his commandments because we love him. We obey his commandments because we're so thankful that he rescued us out of darkness and set us free and brought us into the kingdom of light. We obey his commandments because he's our Lord and we gladly serve him. We gladly honor him. Who else do we want to serve? Not ourselves, I'm sure not see. Not a person. Don't serve a person. Don't serve a person. A person is a hard taskmaster. You can never satisfy them. You can never be what they want you to be. And they aren't either. Don't serve a person. Don't be a slave to a person. And that's not in my notes. Sei kein Sklave für einen Mensch. Die sind ein schwerer Meister. Und du kannst die nie gefallen und nie genug tun. We serve Jesus. Because he's our life. Because we're born again. We're connected to him. And the Spirit of God is that which brings his life through us and flows. It's like the sap. If you love me, verse 10, keep my commandments. You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything different than what he does. When he came to earth, he said, I always do the will of my Father. I always do that which he wants. That's being a disciple. If we keep his commandments, his commandments are not hard, their life, their liberty. But he doesn't act, he's the vine. We are the branches. The vine is totally connected to the Father. And as we are connected to Jesus, he says, if you want to abide in me, if you want to bring fruit, keep my commandments. And he gives us the will and to do his good pleasure. Keep my commandments. And he also says, and I jumped over it somewhere, verse 7. Here's another part of abiding. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. His word, as his word is in our heart, as his word is a part of our life, the written word of God, as we love his word, we keep his word in us, and his word is working in us, he says, then your prayers will be answered. But he says, that's part of abiding. The word of God, this word, is a big part of how we abide in the vine. And obedience, keeping his commandments out of love to him. And then verse 11, he says, this is why I wrote you all this. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Oh, I thought God wanted me to be sad all the time and suffer and oh! No, he wants you to have joy. And first of all, he 
he says, it's my joy. That my joy will remain in you. The same word, remain. State, abide in me, that my joy will abide in you. He uses this word very often. Jesus wants you to have his joy. My joy comes and goes. Your joy comes and goes. But he says, I want you to have my joy. And what was his joy? <sighs> Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. And this is not in my notes. Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. His joy was to do the will of the Father. His joy was to say, I came to do your will. I say what you say. I do what you say. His joy was to see the fruit of his suffering, the fruit of his dying on the cross. His joy was you. Me. You. His joy was to know I'm giving my life, I'm suffering on the cross because I love them. Because I want them. That's his joy. Yes, we're joyful about heaven. Yes, Jesus was happy, I'm sure, to go back to heaven. Very happy. <laughs> to get back to his throne. But he says that my joy might remain in you. A part of this joy is the joy to say, I'm totally yours. I do not belong to myself. My life is yours. You bought me with a price. I love you. You are my life. You are the Fine, I am just a branch, and I'm glad to be a branch because I live through you. You, Jesus, are the joy, and the joy to say, yes, Jesus, you said, be my disciple, let my word abide in you, do what I command you. That means take up your cross daily, deny yourself, follow me. Is that a joy? No. <laughs> Not all the time. More and more as Jesus, through this abiding him, connecting him, as his life flows through us, as he lives through us, as he gives us himself and his life, more and more, his goal, we are to be conformed to Christ. And part of that, and not just imitating him, but he actually lives through us. And if Christ is to live through us as the branch, that means also this attitude, this heart to say, I'm willing to die to sell Jesus that you might live because your life is so much more. Your life is going to change people, not my life. Not your life. Christ through us, in us. That's joy. I'm not sure that I'm there yet, but I want to get there. He says that my joy, his joy, that's a whole sermon on itself. Maybe think about that. His joy might remain in you, stand you. And that your joy might be full. Again, he wants us to have a joy, not a ha, 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 but a deep joy that in spite of the circumstances, in spite of what's happening in the world or in our lives or anyone we love, that our joy is full in him. And isn't it wonderful to be in his presence? What a joy. Isn't it wonderful? Even when it's uncomfortable where he says, um, that's not good in your life, I'm going to cut it off. Okay, it hurts at first, but afterwards you go, Lord, you love me so much. You didn't let that stay there in my life. You saw that was poison. You saw that was not good. You love me so much, you cut it off. You said, leave it behind you. I've got something else. That's a joy. And just the joy of worshiping him, of loving him. The joy of telling people about Jesus. The joy of saying, there is someone who can forgive your sin. There is someone who can set you free. There is someone who can break the power of darkness that is over your life. There is someone, his name is Jesus. There is not a greater joy than to see someone come to Jesus. I think in all, all the years of my ministry, the greatest joy is to see someone come to Jesus, to truly be born again. And the next greatest joy is to see them baptized in water. And the next greatest joy is to see them baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and then to see them following Christ. Joy. It's not just a joy that we have good food to eat. It's so much deeper. Okay, I just want to jump to verse 16 briefly. He said, Ye have not chosen me, verse 16, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whosoever, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. 
His commandment, if you love me, he says you love one another with his love. We don't have it. But he says, I chose you. You didn't come and say, okay, I'm going to be connected to the vine and bring food. He says, no, no, I want you. You be connected to me. You be connected to me. You, you be connected to me. He chose you because he wanted you. Because he loved you. Because he said, there's a purpose for you being born on the earth. And it is not just to do our own thing. You and I are born to bring forth fruit. Born spiritually, bring forth fruit for his honor. And what is more? What is more valuable than that? To glorify God, the purpose we created. To know him, to love him. To have him transform us. And to see other people come to Christ and be disciples. He says, I chose you. We can't even decide to follow Jesus Christ on our own. It says the Father draws people. We're totally dependent on him, but he does draw because he's chosen and he's called. He says, I've called you. So you know what? He's chosen you. And why has he chosen you? You didn't choose him, he said. But I've, um, I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. He's chosen you to bring forth fruit. So that means you will bring forth fruit as you abide in him. I'll bring forth fruit as I abide in him. Because he's producing the fruit, not me. Not you, hallelujah. And that your fruit should remain. That your fruit remains. That this man keeps following Jesus Christ until he brings his last breath or Jesus comes back. That's fruit. That we are more and more transformed into the likeness of Christ. More and more, not just copying him, but he lives through us. His mercy, his kindness, his patience. We're still all producing that, these things, but it's him. He says it will remain. It's not a fly-by-night thing. He's chosen you out of love out of his divine purpose, out of his purpose that was before the beginning of the world, where he saw you, he knew you before you were in your mother's womb, he chose you, he loved you, he loved you before you did anything to deserve that love. Someone once said that. And they said, and then you can't do anything to lose that love. Stay connected. If you're his branch, his love is there. He bought you with a price. Let's remain in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your presence. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Lord, I pray for each person listening that there's somebody that's not connected to the vine that they will be. Lord, thank you. I ask you just encourage each one of us. The fruit comes from you through that intimate, continuing relationship with you. And it's not hard. You're, you're good. You're loving. Lord, it's hard. It's it's the most wonderful thing to be connected to you, to know you, to love you, and say, without you I can do nothing, but with you all things are possible. Glorify yourself through our life. Father, we pray in Jesus' name.